we're thrilled to welcome Eric Kelsey, co-founder and CEO of Dino Therapeutics, to the show with us today. Eric, thank you once again for joining us. Thank you for having me on the show. I'm really happy to be here. Well, let's kick things off with a brief intro, Eric. Uh, thanks. Well, um, actually, one of the things that's interesting about Dino is this is uh, my first company. So prior to Dino, I worked uh, as a postdoc at Harvard Medical School together with George Church at the Wies Institute. Uh, and then before that, I was doing my PhD in systems biology at Harvard. Prior to that, I switched over into biology uh, coming off a background in physics. I did my undergrad at Caltech. You mentioned your undergraduate degree was in physics before you pivoted to bio in grad school. We'd love to ask what brought you to bio? It's a great question. Um, Actually, even, even going back to before college, I really loved um, solving puzzles. I think that's what initially drew me to research. And um, as I was thinking about what I wanted to do coming out of undergrad, I still wanted to like work on the mysteries. And I was looking at, you know, what are the mysteries which are most impactful out in the world today? That's, that's what made me first, you know, begin to see the, the promise of biology. So, you know, what I love about the, the mysteries of biology is, yes, like there's a lot of unknown that makes it hard, <laughs> uh, but the impact is really clear with that new knowledge, with better understanding of capabilities of technology, we can really both like better understand ourselves and then also change uh, our lives and our society to make it better for everyone. So to me, it's that impact part. Um, I've always loved research, but in biology, I just feel there's a lot more potential to apply that research towards impact. Um, and then I, you know, I think there's, there's just a lot of um, overlap of all the things that are supporting biology now, which are exciting, can be exciting no matter what field you're coming from. Um, for example, like where I found this, um, uh, this niche where I could make a unique contribution was through leveraging my past experience with programming and with uh, data analysis and seeing how that was gonna become much more important with these new technologies that enable us to kind of approach uh, experiments programmatically. Uh, so I think the same is true for folks who are coming from other fields uh, like engineering, computer science, even now, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence. There's, there's just so much potential to apply all these technologies that we're developing. Actually, all, all the stuff that we're doing um, in machine learning today at Dino, that's making use of the innovation from the last 10, 20 years uh, in the technology fields, both like building up the cloud computing infrastructures as well as uh, making use of the um, you know, neural network uh, systems, TensorFlow, for example. A lot of these things are open source and it's similar to how um, it's easier than ever to uh, start a company uh, in the tech space thanks to this ecosystem of innovation, it's going to become also easier than ever to start a biotech company to apply those technologies to, uh, to developing better medicines that can help a lot of people. Once again, Eric, so amazing to have you on the show today. Um, before we deep dive, can you provide a brief intro for Dino for us? Of course. So Dino, uh, we are focused on solving the in vivo delivery problem, meaning making it possible to deliver uh, safely and effectively genetic payloads uh, into every organ, every cell type, and for every patient. Right, right. We've been a huge fan of your work so far. And, um, you know, we're kind of just starting out with builders, you know, we always love starting with the intro and the origin story. And really in 2018, Dino emerged from stealth to transform gene therapy with, with artificial intelligence. Taking a step back, can you tell us more about the genesis of Dino? You know, what was the spark that started it all? It's a really interesting question. Uh, and actually, our origin story is maybe a little different from how a lot of companies get their start uh, out of academia. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here to share more about that and hopefully help some of the, the listeners uh, with their own startup journeys. Um, I, I got really interested in startups during my PhD, uh, which was at Harvard, and I, I graduated in 2015. Um, so for example, I spent a lot of time at Harvard's iLab. They had all sorts of programming, just teaching the basics of startups, you know, product market fit, how do you do a pitch? Um, and I was really interested in that because 
academia is fun. It's fun because you're at the cutting edge of knowledge, but sometimes it's lonely. Um, and in like thinking about what I wanted to do after I graduated, uh, like looking back on some of the most fulfilling experiences I had, I really loved working with other talented people solving problems together. So what made me first interested in startups was thinking that I could still do that cutting edge science, um, but do it alongside others with diverse skills and solve problems in a way that would be a lot faster paced and probably also more effective because just like being all there and you know together working on the same thing, you can come up with solutions that maybe you never be able to find on your own. So I was interested in that kind of fast paced environment. That's what made me think when um, I finished my PhD that I was gonna go uh, join an early stage company. Um, maybe someday have an idea that would be like compelling enough for like the right opportunity to start my own company. But first I wanted to learn how companies uh, worked from the inside. Um, so that, that was my plan. Uh, and then I knew though that there were some things that I needed to learn or I wanted to have a better chance to like credibly pitch my skills to a startup company. I had done some really exciting work in my PhD that I felt had applications for industry, but it was more focused on basic biology. So I actually approached George Church, um, who was one of my committee members for my PhD and shared with him what I was thinking, um, in particular to do a really short postdoc in his lab. His lab has a lot of connections to industry and also works on all sorts of new technologies. So I thought that would be a good jumping off point, uh, maybe do like a six month postdoc, wrap up some stuff for my PhD and then have enough experience working on a problem that I could, you know, see the opportunity and uh, pitch it to a prospective employer. So that's how I started um, exploring around and then uh, kind of been looking at where these technologies that I worked on for my PhD, in particular high throughput DNA sequencing applied to do experiments, uh, was asking like, where can we have the most impact for human therapeutics? learned about what was happening in gene therapy at the time. This is prior to any of the FDA approvals, but it was already clear that there was um, a whole set of new technologies, which are just, just coming together at the right time that was gonna make gene therapy possible. It's been a dream for us for the field, you know, for the past 40 or 50 years, but you could really see the promise back then, at the same time, still see the limitations. In particular, the challenge for the field has always been how to safely and effectively deliver genetic cargos into, into the body, that delivery problem. So when I saw that and um, was thinking about how to apply some of the technologies from my PhD, I realized actually, you know, this is a, a perfect type of problem for these technologies. And if we could solve delivery for one company, actually, that's something that many companies uh, would benefit from. So maybe there's there's actually a business here, not just to help my future employer, but to help the entire field. Um, so that that's what got me like first hooked on this idea. Uh, and I, I thought that someday I was going to, you know, start my own company. But um, I'd also consulted for startups, had seen friends go through starting companies before. So I know that it's, I knew back then that it was not an easy thing. Uh, and I wanted to kind of de-risk it to start. In other words, like before changing my career path and saying, yes, I'm going to start this company, who can I go talk to that'll help me evaluate this? Um, because the traditional way to spin a company out of academia is you do all this work, publish a paper, it's great. And then you think, oh, maybe there's a company here. But the, the challenge with that approach is that you might do the, the years of work and realize that you've solved the wrong problem, or you've been thinking the problem was X all the time. And then you know, once you've solved it, you realize actually why is it a more important or industry relevant problem. So uh, I kind of wanted to fast forward to that point and just say, let's assume we can solve this and let me go out and talk to folks who would be the users uh, and ask them, do they care about this thing? Um, for example, if I have a better AV that goes into the muscle or the brain, like, does that make you excited? And, you know, if so, okay, well, would you pay for it? Or what would you need to know in order to be ready to use this? that kind of like uh, customer discovery or market de-risking. So I ended up doing a, a case study um, at, through a course at the Harvard Business School and talked to a bunch of folks in gene editing companies, gene therapy companies, as well as investors uh, who are invested in those types of companies to understand uh, the marketplace. And in that way, really um, improved my understanding of what they would be looking for, uh, as well as just 
confirmed um, that this really is the key challenge in the field. And then if anyone can solve it, then it would help a lot of people, help a lot of patients and also be a really interesting uh, business opportunity uh, for those investors or, or those prospective customers. Mm -hmm. So with, with that in mind, I was like, okay, well, now the market's de-risked and it's really just a matter of, can we actually do it? And on the technical side, I, I felt confident that I could um, do that myself. So then I, I focused on, uh, you know, the lab and getting the technologies together and worked for maybe two or three years before there was a sign that this was going to work, um, which was about a year longer than I expected. But in the end, I always felt there was a way to do it. And to me, the kind of proof point was going to be, when can I convince myself that this is going to work? Because I wanted to get to that point first before then, for example, going out to fundraise and bringing a team around it. Because it's much easier to, you know, give up a project personally. As a postdoc, I had done this several times during my PhD. It, it, it's not easy still, but it's, it's still a lot easier to do that than when you have a whole team uh, and, you know, salaries and everyone um, who depends on the success. So, I wanted to get to that point um, within the academic lab because there's a lot of flexibility and support and I felt that would be faster than spinning out to do a company right away. So from 2015 until kind of middle of 2018, that's that's where we were. And then um, in the middle of 2018, that's when the basics of the technology were working and I can, can share more about uh, how we approached that back then. Um, but it all, uh, and it culminated in a series of presentations that myself and George and uh, one of my collaborators at Harvard gave at the annual uh, American Society for Cell and Gene Therapy Conference, which is like the big gene therapy conference uh, in the field. So we presented the work there and that is what kind of helped me to see that, uh, yeah, we've done enough in academia and now is the right time to get a team behind this, go faster and spin out and uh, start a company. So. That was actually four years ago uh, from now. Uh, and that was really busy back then. Again, going out, talking to customers, talking to investors, and ultimately uh, funded the company at the end of 2018. Four years ago and haven't looked back, right? <laughs> haven't had time to. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. I, I mean, we, we love to hear on the show and just seeing the translational effort, how the sausage is made on the back end from academia going into industry. It's always so cool hearing that transition. As you mentioned, uh, hearing more of the technical efforts, we'd love to hear more. I'm going to pass it off to Chris just to dive in a bit more on that on that technical aspect. Drew and Eric for that great background. It's always exciting to hear when a technologist who's creating a company is also thinking from that problem first commercialization mindset from the very beginning. And it makes sense why you stayed stealth I think, until you had that de-risking process. So that way, when you were ready to move, you could move fast as Dino's rise has been similarly uh, phenomenal. So let's dive deeper then. And as you imply, chat more about Dino's approach. But before we do that a little too much, can you provide context for the audience? Uh, share more about the delivery of gene therapies? What are some of the key unmet needs in the space? Sure. Essentially, all gene therapy companies, they kind of have the same basic properties on their wish list of an ideal vector. Um, again, the goal is we want to safely and effectively deliver genetic uh, payloads into every cell in the body. Of course, they care about a specific organ or a specific cell type. So really, the efficiency of delivery is the most important thing for that. In other words, we want to get into as many cells as we can, ideally every cell or at least enough that it's going to have a meaningful impact on patient quality of life. And that's where the biggest limitations are today. We just don't reach enough of the cells in order to get enough of the therapeutic uh, protein expressed, for example. And that's the reason why actually um, gene therapies are a challenging product to develop, uh, because in order to overcome that limitation, uh, people need to kind of push the limits of what's possible. Uh, that's why, for example, high dose AV um, is one of the more common ways to do gene therapy today. It's high dose because that's the only way in which you can have a chance to treat the disease. But with that also comes challenges. For example, making the dose too high can have uh, safety uh, concerns or risks. And there's even been uh, a few deaths in gene therapy as a result of um, uh, what could be uh, the high dose of the AV. 
So we'd love to improve that uh, in order to make the therapy safer, but in doing so directly make them more effective. Uh, and we can do that by um, changing the delivery. Uh, we focus on the AV capsid, which is the protein shell of a virus. And most gene therapy products today are, are using natural, uh, natural capsids, isolated from natural viruses. They were never evolved in their you know, natural life cycle in order to be maximally effective as a therapeutic uh, gene delivery vector. So there's huge room for improvement there because say uh, a virus would go into the easiest cell in which it could infect and divide. Um, but then uh, you know, there's no reason for that same virus to want to go into a neuron or a heart cell specifically. So that's where there's the room for improvement on the efficiency side. Similarly though, um, natural viruses, they're not very discriminant into which cell types they go into. So if we wanted to be more specifically targeted, say to an organ uh, or to a cell type within that organ. Uh, it's just something that never really needed to happen naturally. It would be beneficial to do that though for a therapeutic perspective, because then by avoiding the off-target organs, we can also reduce the effect of say um, high dose AV uh, where a lot of you know, viral particles accumulate say in the liver or other organs as well. Um, that's where the safety concerns come from. So we can reduce uh, the safety risk by detargeting from those organs as well. So that's the efficiency and the specificity. Additionally, we wanna be able to treat every patient. And another challenge of using the natural viruses is that um, many people have been exposed to uh, natural AV before. So if you've been exposed to a virus, then your body develops antibodies against it. And the sad thing is that if you have those antibodies against the natural virus, then uh, you're unlikely to benefit from a gene therapy that's built around a similar serotype. So this is called pre-existing immunity. And that can affect anywhere from 20 to 80% of patients, depending on the starting natural serotype. But it's really unacceptable from a therapeutic perspective. We want to be able to treat every patient, for every patient to be eligible and able to benefit from the gene therapy. So overcoming pre-existing immunity is one of the big challenges for the field as we've you know, more and more been using the natural uh, capsid serotypes. Additionally, it'd be nice to improve the cargo uh, capacity of the vector. AV is one of the smallest known viruses, fits 4.7 KB, which is enough to fit most of the human genes with a promoter around it, 90% um, you know, or so. But it would be nice to make that 100%, um, and even better to be able to just have extra room within the payload to fit in um, different elements that would make the gene therapy better. For example, the ability to regulate the expression or turn it on and off, or um, maybe specifically express it in a certain cell type. So having more uh, packaging capacity would enable that, as well as there's just always innovation that's happening in the gene therapy field or gene editing field. For example, lots of new ways of using the CRISPR systems, and adding on new pieces that create more, uh, different things you can do within a cell. However, those extra pieces also add additional uh, size uh, to the payload. So every time that we shrink the CRISPR systems down to fit within an AD, someone comes up with a creative way to make it better by adding on more. So there's this continued challenge uh, to fit things within an AD. It would be much nicer if we could actually increase the capacity and then not have to do that every time uh, so that we could fit all these other elements within. So. That's kind of the list of improvements. There's also, along with those, the gene therapies today are they're quite uh, expensive to manufacture. So one of the challenges of engineering AVs is that um, often engineering it to make it better in one function makes it more difficult to manufacture. And for reasons that are um, kind of easy to understand in retrospect, but still make it challenging to do. So we certainly don't wanna make it more difficult to manufacture the, the AVs. We want to kind of optimize for manufacturing in addition to all these other properties. Even better would be to improve the manufacturability of them or improve the ease by which we can purify them, say at large scale, which would reduce the manufacturing cost. Um, so we can both improve that directly, but we can also improve the manufacturability through some of those other properties too, especially the efficiency. For example, if we make, um, the delivery 10 times more efficient, then maybe we can now get into enough cells or more types of cells to make the product effective. 
But then if we go from 10 times to 100 times more efficient, now we can effectively treat the same uh, number of patients uh, with a 10 times lower dose or with 10 times more uh, doses that are produced per batch, which then reduces the cost of goods. So in any case, efficiency is important and that's gonna help us for the manufacturing as well as for the safety. So there are clearly, and you've articulated it incredibly well, a number of challenges from specificity to efficiency, to size, to manufacturability. With that understanding, can you describe for us how uh, Dino's approach is addressing these challenges? We have developed this uh, approach that we call machine guided design. And this is really a different way to engineer any genetic sequence from where people have most often tried it in the past. There's really kind of two different styles of protein engineering. One of them on the directed evolution side, one on the uh, rational design. So for directed evolution, that's really optimizing for the throughput. For example, you can build a really big library, um, but it's kind of like buying lottery tickets. The chance of any one variant being a winner is very low. And the reason is that the ways in which people most often build large libraries is through randomly uh, mutating the DNA sequence, or that, that then turns into a random protein sequence. So you can definitely easily make millions or billions of different variants if you're doing, say, combinatorial degenerate synthesis. The challenge, though, is that because it's randomly made, uh, most of those variants are not going to be improvements. And actually, even worse, most of them will break the function of the protein entirely. So the quality of those random libraries is typically pretty low. That's also true for AV, even maybe more so than any other protein. It's, it's a very challenging protein to engineer. Most of the changes that you make somewhere on the capsid are gonna break the function. And that's true for even a single change. Uh, if you start to introduce multiple changes together, then it, it becomes even harder. So the question is, how could you optimize for the quality? And there, um, for example, you could look at the three-dimensional structure of the protein, or you could look at the literature and based upon some understanding of the mechanism, use that to rationally design um, changes to the protein. So this is the you know, field of rational design. There, the quality is higher, but the challenge is that um, it's hard to do a lot of good guesses. The throughput is very low, either because um, there's just you know, a few papers to read, few hypotheses, which we can use to inform uh, the improved uh, libraries, or we just don't know enough about it. And that's also true for AV. There's, there's a lot of the basic biology that we don't understand about how capsids interact with the body, receptors on different cell types. Um, so even based upon the mechanism alone, it's hard to think of too many good ways to improve the, the capsids. So machine-guided design makes use of these new technologies, uh, in particular advances on the ability to generate data uh, in vivo that then enables us to inform um, the design of improved libraries. So it's kind of like rational design, except that rather than using our intuition and our understanding of the mechanism to build a library, we're just gonna go to the data itself and in a data-driven way, find patterns and then use those to design a better library. And what's nice about that is the more data we can generate, the more patterns we'll find. And therefore the more good guesses we'll have for the next round of the uh, library design. So machine guided design, the reason why we uh, bring machine learning into that is that in addition to the amazing ability to generate lots of data using new technologies, we also now have automated ways of analyzing that data, finding patterns. In particular, this is the field of machine learning. So if we build a machine learning model, which is predictive of the function, then we can query that model over and over. Uh, and that's how we can then generate very large libraries, getting up to that size that was possible before with direct evolution. So uh, for example, at Dino today, typically we'll do library sizes of 100,000 or even a million different variants just by querying the model. We'll actually do an even broader search in silico, say look at a billion different sequences and then prune that down to 100,000. So looking at like, um, you know, 10,000 sequences for everyone that we test. That's an example of the kind of throughput that we're able to, to capture, but then each of those guesses is a very high quality design. It's informed by all the data we have. So we can optimize both for the, the throughput and the quality, which is how we maximize the expected value of success. So this kind of approach is really gonna change 
all of protein engineering. And I, I think I saw that early because for my PhD, I had worked on uh, similar approaches on the DNA uh, sequencing side. Went to George's lab to learn the DNA synthesis. And then along the way, we uh, created this approach to leverage machine learning to improve the efficiency of design. So that's what we uh, set out to apply to um, the AV capsid in order to kind of learn everything we could about what changes to the capsid will impact the function and then apply that to the design of improved capsids for solving these you know, key and that needs for patients. You've also in the past talked about uh, the genetic microscope technology that Dino has, and that's also enabling your work. Would you mind giving us just a quick overview there of how it fits in, what it yeah. is, how it fits in? So this is the, the way in which we can generate a huge amount of in vivo data that helps us understand how changes to the capsid sequence affect the function. And there's basically two technologies that make that possible. One is the high throughput DNA synthesis, which is really comes out of the microarray printing technologies, which are decades old, but you can think about that, you know, there's different spots on a slide and each one is printed with a different DNA sequence. So instead of using that as a probe, you can just cut off all the DNA and put it into a pool. So this is a um, technology that's called oligo pools for DNA oligos. And the throughput of that is, as I said, hundreds of thousands of sequences of, you know, hundreds of bases long can now just be routinely ordered and arrive in the tube within a few weeks. That's really interesting kind of ability to design an experiment, but then we also need the ability to measure what happens. So we do that in kind of two ways. First is we can synthesize the different capsid sequences that we wanna uh, test. Um, we then, through a variety of different uh, molecular biology tricks, we link those to DNA barcodes. So the capsid might have a mutations, you know, in any location, and then the DNA barcode is mapped to that mutation so that if we see the barcode in our pool, we know which capsid it corresponds to. And then we produce a library of these capsids. So each one, each capsid then packages that DNA barcode. And by tracking what happens to those barcodes, we can know what happened to the capsids. For example, some of them won't even produce, the, the capsid won't assemble and therefore some of the barcodes drop out. So we measure before and after production and now we have a measurement for the production efficiency. Then we take that produced viral library and we, for example, inject it into an animal. At Dino, we're most focused on testing in non-human primates because those are much more relevant for gene delivery in humans. And also we know that um, there's differences between, for example, the delivery efficiency in smaller animals like mice and non-human primates and humans. And so we really need to um, choose the models which are most predictive of what will happen in humans. And that, that's why we focus on primates. That said, uh, those are both um, very precious animals and it's also logistically very complicated and expensive to do uh, those studies. So what's really exciting about these new measurement technologies is even from a single animal, we can learn a huge amount. So taking that viral library, injecting it say into the blood, now we can go look at every organ. And from each organ, we can sequence out the barcodes and know what happened. So that enables us to make hundreds of thousands of measurements uh, in each organ, multiply times all the samples that we take across the whole animal. So there's really a huge amount of data that now can be captured, again, in vivo in ways that are really predictive of what will happen in humans. And this is in general a field of what's called DNA multiplexing. Multiplexing because we're putting many experiments together in one tube or in this case, one animal and then reading it out through the DNA barcodes that makes use of the next gen sequencing, primarily Illumina, but more and more there's new ways of measuring long reads which are also becoming relevant for the, the scale of libraries that we test uh, within the company. So then you have your machine guided design that I believe is called Dino's Capsid Map Platform. Without giving too much away, I would assume that the uh, in vivo testing then reinforms the Capsid Map Platform. So that way you can apply the unique value of machine learning to address the current challenges of viral vector development. Yeah, let me explain some of the origins of the terms because it actually all, it all fits together. It's the same uh, workflow. So we called it Capsid Map because 
protein engineers, when they think about engineering proteins, they often think about what's called a fitness landscape. It's like if you had the protein sequence base and at every point in that space, you measure the height. That's just like the contours of the landscape. And in our case for Dyna, we're focused on solving in vivo delivery. So our focus is understanding the capsid fitness landscape. So we call it capsid map because we're serving that landscape with every experiment we do. We're choosing a bunch of points that we want to measure using DNA synthesis. We can then go out and test exactly that variant and mm -hmm. take the measurement. But then we want to fill in all the details from those survey points. We want to know the shape of the entire landscape. So the machine learning is what enables us to do that. We can fit this machine learning model to all that data. And now, not just going to the points that we've measured, but any, any point on that whole space, we can ask the model, where do you think this is? Like, is it above or below the points that have been measured around it? So imagine like you're measuring a few different points and you kind of fit a line or you know, surface to that. You can know that you're on the you know a slope and if you keep going this direction you're going to keep going higher even though you haven't measured anything over there you know it's a good direction to go so in the next round of experiments we're going to fall by looking in that area so that's how the you know the mapping analogy comes into dino we're, we're following the contours of the landscape we want to go up to the peaks the mountaintops where the best variants are found that's what we were thinking about when we named the company dino Dino is a climbing term, which is this kind of bold move in which you jump off the landscape and you grab on um, to the top, so grabbing onto a hold, um, which really matches the kind of power of the new technologies as well as the boldness of being able to find those uh, those best variants as quickly as possible. I honestly was wondering what was behind the logo for Dino, and now that yeah, and then also makes a lot of sense. the landscapes behind me are the same the same theme. Yeah, that's great. So then without maybe giving too much away, can you share how this capsid mapping approach improves for things like tissue targeting or immune evasion? It's really quite simple. Um, we just measure the properties that we want to optimize for, and then we use the machine learning to accelerate our search of variants which have those improvements. So for example, with tissue targeting, we're injecting a, a library, which is meant to sample that landscape. And we then look in the target tissues and we say, which capsids made it here, which ones didn't. And then from that, we learn the sequence differences that um, led to some of those capsids going there and others not. Those are the patterns that we recognize. And then we try to follow the contours of uh, those predictions in the next round to make it even better and iteratively improve uh, the properties over time. So it's pretty simple to do that for the tissue targeting because we can directly, um, you know, dissect out the tissue and compare um, across all the different tissues where uh, where the sequences matter. Similarly, though, we can continue to refine the assays, for example, to get down to the cell type level. So one of the big advances over the last year uh, was we've developed the ability to measure tropism using single cell sequencing technology. So now say within the eye or within the brain where there's a lot of cell type heterogeneity, we can know not only that the AVs are going there, but also in which cell type they're transducing. That's of course critical for uh, gene therapy where the cell type really matters for the underlying uh, patient on that need. So that's how we do it for the tissue targeting. For immune evasion, there's a number of things um, that might play into that. For example, detargeting from the organs where there might be some immune response. Um, detargeting from liver, detargeting from dorsal root ganglion for, for example, CNS therapies. Those are ways to make therapy safer, uh, but can also reduce the immune response uh, against uh, the therapies. However, there's also the pre-existing immunity that I mentioned before. Um, if people have been exposed to a natural serotype, which is similar in sequence to what a gene therapy is using for the capsid, then they won't be eligible or, or won't benefit from the therapy. So in order to make uh, a gene therapy, which is universal, meaning that every patient would benefit from it, we're probably gonna need to make significant number of changes away from the natural serotypes to kind of resurface the entire capsid. And resurfacing would be beneficial because antibodies are binding all across the surface, but if we completely change all the surface, then no antibodies that exist against pre-existing, uh, against natural serotypes would be binding to this new synthetic uh, capsid. 
So in that way, every patient would be able to benefit at least once from the gene therapy. And then combined with other ways of suppressing the immune system, then that would enable things like the redose of gene therapy, which is another major uh, goal for the field. So then as we think about this, and as you talk about the landscape being developed um, through more pattern matching, as with everything in the tech biospace that's so data-driven, the potential of technologies builds over time as you learn more about those patterns. So from 2018 to where you are today, how has Dino's platform grown, developed uh, into its own potential? Well, we made a lot of progress. Um, the work that we did at Harvard uh, kind of first showed the, the proof of concept for this by measuring the properties of uh, AV delivery in mice. Mm -hmm. And where we began as a company starting out was to scale everything up and be able to measure in vivo delivery within non-human primates, which as I said, is much more relevant for clinical gene therapy. Um, and actually with regard to the technical details, if anyone's interested to learn more, you can check out the publications page of our website. We've published a lot on this. Um, the measurement technology uh, was published, uh, it came out in science and then on the machine learning, using that to improve the efficiency of library design, that was a fall publication that came out um, a year or two later, that was Nature Biotech. So actually a lot of the details are out there and that's been really great for us because it's what uh, enabled us to work with so many great partners uh, and also has helped us to build a really uh, amazing team. Just folks seeing those technologies out there and seeing how we're at the cutting edge uh, really made them want to come to Dino where we have this wealth of data uh, in order to continue improving that state of the art. Um, so I, I guess where we, you know, have been focused since developing the early technology, as you asked the question, um, is, is really getting it closer to the patient impact. So one of that was just, as I said, scaling up the experiments, getting more relevant data from uh, more relevant animal models. We've uh, made our focus to start in four organ areas, the eye, uh, the muscle, the CNS, and the liver. Mm -hmm. So being able to measure transduction from each of those efficiently was one of our first focuses. But we also want to, again, think about that end goal of helping patients and making sure that we're on track to achieve that goal. So um, kind of the same story as what I told you before, in first uh, imagining the company and then going out and talking to potential customers, um, that was like the first uh, cycle through this uh, entrepreneurship loop. Ultimately, deciding that it was a good idea, then de-risking the technology, then go getting the resources needed to start the company. Uh, so it was kind of the same thing all over again uh, once we uh, did the seed round. Um, and that was going out to talk to partners. Now that we have a team operating, we're running experiments, uh, how can we help you solve uh, your needs? Um, so became very active in the partnering discussions just immediately after starting the company. And um, that was great because it enables us to further test the thesis that this is uh, going to be a great business return money to our uh, investors, as well as making sure that we have the relationships and kind of knowledge sharing in place with those across the industry in order to enable us to develop uh, these improved vectors that are gonna help our partners make uh, better products. So that um, led to our first uh, partnerships a uh, few years after we started the company. Um, first one with uh, Novartis in the eye and Srepta in the muscle. And we followed that up um, shortly after with a partnership with Roche Group and including with Spark uh, in the CNS and the liver. And then most recently, uh, we've done a partnership with Estellas, uh, focusing also in the muscle. So that, that's kept us pretty busy. Um, actually, Estellas was just announced last year. Uh, last year, we then kind of did that cycle once more, which is uh, we did our Series A, uh, led by uh, Andreessen Horowitz. Um, that was 100 million, and the thesis of that was that now we've shown that you know we're, we're building a product that uh, our partners will want and that we're solving a problem that's gonna help a lot of patients. And we just wanna do this faster, both to get those better AV vectors in the hands of our current partners, as well as anticipating the needs of all of our future partners, accelerating the R&D progress and done that first by building up the team. Uh, we're now at just over 80 employees and uh, we just opened up a new facility in Watertown 
to, to house this larger team and really scale up the experiment. So um, it kind of never, as I said, haven't had a chance to even catch our breath uh, since the seed because all, all these things are just changing so fast. Uh, so I, I can say that um, it's just been a tremendous journey and really exciting to have so many great people join us on this journey, including our partners, including all those on our team um, and excited for what we can do next. It's amazing to hear the, the journey, Eric, in, in, in its entirety. And I think as we're coming to the next stage of the episode, we really want to focus in on kind of those major challenges, accomplishments. Just take a step back. As we've seen with tech bio companies today, we're, we're seeing as much innovation on the business side uh, as the science side of, of life sciences. And that innovation can at times uh, be ahead of the market. So as we're reshaping that, as one of the platforms leading the charge, can you share how Dino thinks about go-to-market strategy and your broader company journey? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, actually, th there's like a few a few things that have stuck in my mind, even going back to really early on, as I was first thinking about startups or thinking about whether this was an idea that was worthy of being its own startup. Um, and and Paul Graham has a, a piece of advice to founders uh, in terms of what how can I make a company? What should my idea die? Um, his advice is just make something people want. And the point is that you have to kind of work backwards from that as you're thinking about all the different technologies that you can apply. Um, in our case, within healthcare, you know, our goal is to help patients. So the starting point has to be, where's the patient I might need? That's where, you know, drugs are going to have a market. That's where, um, partners are going to want to make those drugs. And so working backwards from that patient I might need has always been really helpful for me and actually really um, kind of like refreshing from the perspective of how to work on technologies because it's no longer about, you know, how do I apply this particular technology to solve this problem or to solve some problem, like thinking technology first. It's thinking about that problem and using whatever you can to solve it. And if you choose the right problem, then it doesn't really matter what you do. Uh, if you find a solution, then a lot of folks are going to be excited about it. And it's going to be really satisfying because you're going to help a lot of people. So uh, to me, as I was thinking about where, you know, might these technologies be uh, applied, this kind of um, unifying grand challenge for the field of solving in vivo gene delivery, that was really helpful for me because, you know, it's been a challenge for decades and it's so important in order to realize the potential of gene therapy. But obviously it's no secret that this is a challenge and everyone knows about it, which is great. Um, because if you, you know, have some promising approach, then they're gonna pay attention to that. Um, but also because it's been challenging to solve, uh, that's the perfect uh, kind of playing field for new technologies. It wouldn't make sense to go after an easier problem with a new technology where some you know existing solution might work fine. So really focusing on those grand challenges has been um, valuable for me. And I kind of thought about it um, like coming out of academia, no one loves peer review because there's always like one um, you know obstinate <laughs> reviewer who is just causing problems. Uh, even though in general the system does improve the quality of uh, you know the work that gets published. So I, I kind of found this idea of the grand challenges uh, is it's like nature's peer review. Like there's an objective uh, criteria here that can measure success. And all you have to do is do the experiment to know if, you, if you're doing a good job or not. And it's very fair. So you just gotta you know, apply all your innovation and then use that experiment to ultimately tell you whether you're doing things in the right way. Um, what's really interesting about the delivery problem and how that fits into the, the field of gene therapy is it's not just one problem, it's actually a whole family of related problems. So for example, being able to do this once, say make a better AV for the eye, actually a very similar set of technologies and capabilities could then be applied to either make it better, better and better in the eye, but also solve related problems like going into the muscle or the heart or the CNS. Um, even within the CNS, you could say there's a whole variety of related problems there, 
colostrum, the blood brain barrier being a first big one, but then going into all the different brain regions or different cell types uh, efficiently. Each of those is going to have its own patient population that needs uh, a gene therapy in order to benefit. So to, to me, that's where it made sense to think about Dino as a platform because we can really invest in those capabilities and then reuse them in ways that enable us to take on the next challenge, apply all the learnings from solving this first one, and then go off to do the next ones faster or in a way that has less marginal cost for us than it would for some competitor or even some partner. And that's how we can fit into the ecosystem in a way that we're continually leveraging our strengths and we're able to do things that our partners either can't or just wouldn't be able to do it as quickly as, as Dino. Um, and that, that's a really good position to be in when it comes to a, being a platform company because, well, the field is already very competitive, right? In gene therapy, the, you know, especially thanks to genome sequencing, the um, genetic diseases are well-defined. We have the ability to diagnose them. In many cases, companies are even, um, you know, creating products that look very similar, almost identical payloads. And so delivery really can differentiate for them the, um, the value of the product and the ability for it to uh, provide some patient benefit. And for that reason, speed is quite important. They would rather come work with Dino, even if they could solve it themselves eventually, it's, it's better to work with uh, the leader in the field and get there sooner because then they can focus on doing the next drug uh, and applying all of their uh, strengths as well. So th this is, sometimes I call it like the modular nature of the gene therapy. If we solve delivery, it doesn't help just one product, but actually helps many companies. Each product is a different payload, but they can all make use of the same uh, delivery vector. And that way, um, just by developing vectors, we can kind of multiply the effectiveness of the entire field. And that fits in with our thesis as a company that we want to maximize our impact on patients. So for that reason, we uh, built the business model to be partner-centric. Mm -hmm. And we've now done these four partnerships with uh, Novartis, Sarepta, uh, Roshan, and Stellis. But in the future, we want to continue to work with every uh, company that's developing uh, gene therapy. And, with a thesis that we can help get them there faster or make their products more effective using all the learnings and lessons from our years of experience uh, engineering delivery. So I, I think that there's, there's probably gonna be a lot of companies that make use of technologies like Dino is doing and can find ways to distribute those all across the, the field and help more patients. But to me, when I was thinking about these technologies, I was kind of thinking about this on the business side and asking, of all the things we could do since we've seen this opportunity maybe earlier than others have recognized it let's just find the one that's most compelling you know where there's the most value to be created and at least do a good job there if we're successful there then there will be future ways in which we can expand the platform and we can go after those at the right time but i didn't want us to be spread too thin too early because then we might you know not solve anything or might be outcompeted by someone who's more focused so that's why you know, even though machine guided design is a very general uh, set of uh, technologies and can be applied to any genetic sequence, Dyna from the very beginning has been focused on solving a very clearly defined problem and one that's very important for helping patients. And through that focus, we can then kind of test ourselves against nature's peer review, continue to improve the capabilities, improve the platform in ways that maybe it would be harder if we were spread thin or would be harder if we chose an easier problem to work on. Uh, but then all those capabilities can be applied at scale uh, based upon our initial success. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I mean, it's been amazing to see this vision and how it's played out for, for you and the team at Dino um, for the beginning conceptual idea of let's take a platform company to AAV therapies. And I'm really curious, uh, just, just generally being interested in um, capsid manufacturing, especially in AAVs, um, how you'll, you know, approach biodistribution and just reaching other places in the body like CNS. Interesting stuff. Um, and I think earlier when you mentioned the partnership and platform model, uh, you also talked about the idea of we just, we just want to do this, but bigger, right? And um, kind of just taking a step back and, and seeing your scale and your growth, um, being able to pioneer exciting approaches in AAV vector design. Um, as you mentioned, the team and you closed a 100 million Series A round from Andreessen last year. 
um, you know, first of all, congrats. <laughs> um, but really looking back uh, at this, this kind of beginning of the journey, you know, what have been some of the greatest challenges that you really faced at Dino building up to this point? Uh, that's a great question. And there's, there's been so many. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to um, try to think about it. Um, I mean, one, one is a uh, lab space. <laughs> if you talk about challenges and headaches, um, it's, it's both, uh, you know, fast growth and is, is a blessing. Um, but then we're always thinking about, you know, how are we going to get our experiments done? And lab space has been a challenge, uh, from the very beginning. We were, we were actually really fortunate to start the company within the lab central incubator, which enabled us to go, you know, from one bench to 12 pretty quickly, but then ever since then, it's just been a really complicated logistics puzzle thinking about how we grow to the next size. Um, luckily we have really fantastic people on the operation side who have managed this, uh, so well. Um, and then we've just been fortunate to find, um, various homes either you know, at the very beginning of COVID. And then we had uh, like a one year sublease, uh, last year in kind of an odd location, but one that worked really well for where we need to be. Uh, and we just uh, moved into this, this actually really beautiful facility in Watertown. So hopefully we won't have to worry <laughs> so much about that for the, the near term. Um, that, that, that aside, I think like there's just so many things that come up day to day, uh, like so many unexpected results or, you know, different, um, experimental, uh, or logistical challenges that we, uh, that we see. Um, I would say what makes it all great is that we're, we're one team. We're committed to success as a company. We pitch in where it's needed and even, even great challenges, you know, they teach us a lot about how to do this the next time in, in a way that's better. So I've been really, um, appreciative of like the the learning culture that we've developed and how even those you know crucible moments for us as a company can have a uh, silver lining in terms of the things we learn and how that makes us a stronger company and a, uh, a better working team love it yeah so you know now just kind of looking towards the future just what's coming next for dino well we still want to solve the in vivo delivery problem and we've been kind of eyeing that now, you know, for eight plus years, um, just thinking about how to do it and really excited now to have both the team, the resources, the partners um, for all these pieces to come together. So uh, what I hope you'll see in the coming year or year is our better capsules coming out of the platform and, you know, going into partner hands, then finding success within their own clinical programs. Uh, and then these uh, capsules turning into gene therapy products that are going to help a lot of patients that's going to be an amazing moment, uh, not only for Dino, but for the field. And I certainly believe it's going to happen as much as there's a lot of in the discussion about the growing pains of the field. There's now so many talented people working in gene therapy and so many promising new approaches that are just moving their way through the clinical pipeline that I'm confident that this is going to be a modality that will change so many people's lives. And it's just going to take us time before we figure out all the different pieces so that every patient uh, can benefit that. But I, I feel that we're really fortunate to be working in science at this time. Um, actually, for me, when I went to my first ASGCT meeting, it was just like um, uh, an overwhelming feeling seeing that like direct patient impact and seeing videos, say, of, of children um, who receive a gene therapy and you know before they were unable to sit up and then after they're jumping around and smiling. This is actually from um, the second FDA approved gene therapy, Zolgensma, which is for a disease called spinal muscular atrophy. So I saw some of the videos from that at my first ASGCT and I was like, wow, like patient impact in this field is so tangible, so you know, heartwarming. And I'm, I'm just excited to see more uh, life-changing treatments like that, both from Dino and from you know, the entire ecosystem that's working together. Yeah, I, I have seen the same Zolgensma videos that they've been, you know, amazingly impactful, at least to my own, uh, you know, scientific thought looking towards the future. And, um, you know, it's, it's even amazing to see people at Dino are, are, are seeing those videos and being able to um, take a glimpse into the future of uh, potentially, you know, what a, a venture like your own is going to be impacting, hopefully, hopefully soon, um, and supporting that ecosystem as a whole. 
So tying into these threats, uh, thinking about really patient impact as a whole and then looking into the future, with the adoption of Dino's platform and the scale of vector manufacturing, we'll, we'll hopefully see the cost barriers changing for the therapeutic ecosystem. Uh, but, you know, for you personally, Eric, you know, when do you see this tipping point really happening for the, for the market? I mean, I, I think that there already has been a tipping point in terms of all the components have now come together. There's two FDA approved gene therapies. There's a lot of others that are looking really promising under development. And there's innovation happening at so many different points of the kind of gene therapy product that each one of those is, is just gonna make um, gene therapies better. And in some, it's gonna really change what's possible. Obviously at Dyna, we're focused on solving in vivo delivery. So I can tell you maybe where some of the things that I'm looking at first uh, might come from, but then I, I could say a little bit more uh, beyond Dyna. Um, so first off is by improving the efficiency of delivery. Again, that makes new therapies possible. Um, we want to be able to go into every organ, every cell type, uh, but also makes them, uh, the therapies safer uh, and also more affordable. And I think that there's huge room for improvement there on the order of hundredfold, maybe even more uh, in inefficiency. So that's going to really open up the number of diseases which are treatable with gene therapy, as well as really dramatically make them better, safer, and, and uh, more cost-effective. Additionally, we want to be able to treat every patient. That's going to require solving the problem of pre-existing immunity. But again, I think now, especially thanks to uh, the work we've done with machine learning, we've shown that we can explore really far away from the natural stereotypes. In principle, even changing every position on the protein that enables us to resurface the capsids. And in that mode, we can then, you know, make a vector which is completely unlike anything that exists in nature and every patient can benefit. So those are maybe two of the areas which broaden the um, possibility space for gene therapy. Additionally, there's many folks who are thinking about the immune uh, system. And I think by transient suppression of the immune system, when a patient receives a gene therapy, that will enable the ability to redose, which is critical because both that, that helps an individual patient um, make sure they get the right amount of the gene therapy for it to be effective for them, or say an adolescent who's treated early on in life. And then when they grow to an adult, they need a you know, let's say it's a liver therapy. So the liver is grown and now a, a new dose might um, enable them to continue the benefits of that therapy even into old age. Um, so redose could be one of the ways in which we can improve the administration of gene therapies. Additionally, bringing down the cost, uh, not just through improvements of efficiency, but actually just new ways of building AV. For example, today, still most AVs are produced using um, human cells. And there's a lot of challenges of doing that or scaling it up. And I think a lot of potential to use other systems um, in order to solve the manufacturing challenge or solve the bottleneck that currently exists. That would be transformative because with redose and lower cost, um, now you could begin to think about receiving, uh, first off, treating every uh, patient, like anyone uh, in the world might be benefited uh, at some point by a, a gene therapy. And with those, it would be affordable, as well as if you can redose, then even one person might wanna receive multiple gene therapies in their lifetime for completely different uh, indications. Uh, and so in that way, gene therapy could become a much more mainstream way of treating disease. And uh, like I said, there's, it's not really so much an inflection point as just a gradual series of improvements that in some are gonna kind of add up to uh, a really transformative new way to make your cells and your organs uh, healthier. It's so amazing to hear um, and just be able to see your your perspective, Eric, on, on kind of the future and kind of just wrapping up into our closing thoughts. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to Chris here just to expand on, on some of these future crystal ball predictions that, that we love asking experts as yourself. So before we come to a close, Eric, as Drew said, a few rapid fire questions. Imagine it's 2050. Can you describe the fields of gene therapy? What challenges have been addressed? Uh, maybe what diseases have been treated or where are we headed? It's a really interesting question. And it's so hard to predict. 
um, just because gene therapy has been a, a, a beautiful idea for decades. And just recently we started to see um, the potential to do in vivo gene therapy using AV. So just thinking, you know, another three decades in the future and imagine what that's like. Uh, I'm excited for it for sure, but it's really hard uh, to imagine. That said, I think just based upon the progress that we're seeing in Dino, as well as the potential of the technologies we work with to improve the way in which we can engineer proteins, I, I'm really optimistic for that future. Um, and I think we should be bold in like what we're aspiring to do. So, you know, now we know of thousands of monogenetic diseases. And if we can deliver to every organ, every cell type, I think we should aim to develop therapies for all of these diseases. And hopefully by uh, 2050, we're routinely treating uh, all of them, uh, as well as thinking about not just monogenetic diseases, but polygenetic diseases, diseases where um, many genes might contribute to that, but with some genetic perturbation, we can make cells, uh, make organs uh, more healthy. And even uh, non-genetic conditions, uh, again, where there's some genetic uh, lever that we can use in order to put cells in a healthier state. So obviously that's going to require a lot of things, but they're exactly the same problems that I've already mentioned that we want to solve. Safe, effective, uh, universal, and affordable uh, gene therapy. I, I think it will happen, um, and I think that the benefits of it will help every uh, living person. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot of changes in society in order for us to do this, not just on the scientific side, but in terms of how we support uh, treatments of this type through the healthcare system, how we ensure uh, universal access uh, to these types of medicines. But I think if we can do those and do so responsibly, then it'll enable us to think about you know, gene therapy, much like any other medicine that you might want to take, you know, even over the counter, uh, enabling people to drive these decisions themselves um, and kind of manage their own uh, DNA. Uh, I think that's coming. And uh, as a society, we've, you know, a lot of the pieces are in place for that to happen as well. It's just that change will take some time to roll out. In general, uh, when I talk about this, uh, I refer to it as genetic agency. It's enabling people to um, make their own decisions about what's going to be happening to their genome. And uh, I think there's a lot of, you know, really interesting ethical questions there in order to make that most impactful and most universal, but um, by 2050, I hope that we will have uh, figured out a way to make that happen as well. So it's still 2050. Uh, hopefully we have a bit more genetic agency, but where's Dino in that process? We actually have a, a mission statement, um, which I've been thinking about exactly for this reason, because I um, feel the mission should be true forever. And even though the things that we do might change, uh, that can always be our like North Star for deciding what we're gonna do. Um, so for, for Dino, our mission statement is empowering diverse teams of high potential problem solvers to transform patient lives with cutting edge science. So the cutting edge will have expanded by then, but I want us to always be at that cutting edge because that's where there's new opportunities, both from the new knowledge that we gain about how biology works, as well as the new capabilities that are made possible through new technologies. We always want to focus on those transformative uh, uh, therapies. Gene therapy certainly is that type now, but in the future there will be, again, new types of therapies, and we want to focus on the ones that are most impactful to patients. And then where we see opportunities for Dino is, same as we did today, it's solving unmet need, brings in the cutting edge science, but Internally, like how we approach that, I, I want to ensure that we always do a great job at bringing teams together. That focus on teamwork has been with the company from the very beginning, and I hope stays with the company even as we grow. Um, so we call that empowering diverse teams. Empowering because we both support people, you know, with the basic training and skills to do something themselves, but also with clarity uh, of goals and you know, with decision-making frameworks and scopes so that people can drive it for themselves. Uh, and then diversity, because we need many different types of people, you know, different skills, different disciplines in order to come together to solve problems at these cutting edge frontiers, as well as just different experiences that enable us to be creative as a, as a team or to be resilient to the challenges that we'll face 
developing these new uh, approaches. So those are some of the things that we really internally want to organize to be exceptional at, differentiate our culture with respect to that, and that will create new opportunities based upon the folks who will want, want to come to join our team. I love that inclusion of team building and empowerment. It's really something we focus a lot here on BIOS, and that's always wonderful to hear a founder being so passionate about building and empowering diverse teams. Would you have any advice, Eric, to share with current graduate students, professors, given your own experience, uh, for those who might be interested in starting their own company? In terms of advice for folks, like if, if any of this is exciting to you, there's definitely something you can do to help, some way to contribute. Uh, I've always found, um, you know, advice about how to decide what to do is asking yourself, like, what are, what are my unique advantages? What can I do, you know, best or in a way that's unique or based upon the knowledge I have or the skills I have, I'm able to see problems or see solutions differently than others and trying to find things like that. Um, that's certainly how it was for me as I was coming out to the kind of second half of my PhD. I was doing biology because I wanted to do experiments because I felt like having that direct access to nature's peer review is like the way in which um, I can control my own destiny. But then, you know, I was a little frustrated back then because it was like one petri dish, one experiment, and it just felt like I wasn't using the other half of my training. Um, so then when I saw these new technologies with the DNA sequencing come online, at that time they were primarily being used to sequence whole genomes, but seeing that you could apply this, uh, you know, in a new way towards that genetic microscope, I was like, oh, that's, that's a really interesting new approach. And I feel like I have something unique I can offer there based upon, you know, the ability to do both experiments and to analyze the data. So I think similarly for anyone, you know, who's earlier in their career, or in, even in academia, thinking about where they can make an impact in industry, finding those um, you know, unique skills and finding out where they can be applied in a way that maybe others aren't gonna see the same types of problems that you will. Um, uh, that, that's how I would start. And then um, I guess, again, trying to <laughs> wrap up some of the, the lessons learned from me and like shifting from scientist into entrepreneur, um, like just go out and talk to people about your ideas um, and get feedback if it's really a good idea or find the decision makers who are ultimately going to, you know, fund the company or become your first customers and ask them how they would make that decision. Not being too um, concerned about the secrecy of the idea. Yes, like you should be thoughtful about it and work with great people. Those are always important. But what's nice about leveraging your unique strengths is that you're, you're already ahead in that you already have something to offer that maybe most people won't. So then you can be a little more open about what you're doing because if, they, if people actually like this, they're gonna wanna work with you rather than to do it themselves. So that I found really helpful because that feedback that you get from others can really enable you to spot the path forward to take things uh, ahead quickly rather than you know, falling off track. If you keep things secret, maybe um, you end up working on the wrong thing for too long and the opportunity passes you by. Um, when it comes to like working at the cutting edge of science, it um, can be stressful. And so trying to like make sure that you're doing the right thing is really key um, because any really good idea in science or technology, it's only a good idea for a limited window of time. So that's why um, you know, in some ways, if you're going to uh, be the first or be the one who um, realizes that opportunity, you, you have to do it in this way. You have to be open about what you're doing. You have to get feedback in order to move quickly um, and plan for success. Maybe it doesn't work out, but then you learn a lot along the way. And then just repeat this process again. Take all those learnings, find out what's the new thing that you have to offer, and then do it again. Um, and, you know, at least those are some of the lessons that worked well for me. And I, if they benefit anyone who's out there thinking about something similar, uh, well, I, I would just really love, uh, uh, <laughs> really love to, to, to hear that. And um, I hope it does. Absolutely phenomenal advice, Eric. I think everyone in academia is, especially those who have a translation commercialization mindset are gonna be thrilled to learn from your experience. 
as we come to this close. Uh, do you have any other closing thoughts, shameless plugs, anything you'd like to share with the audience? Um, I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to be on here and to share uh, some of our story. Uh, I guess if anything else, I'd, I'd just love to thank uh, the Dino team uh, who have just made the last four years such an amazing uh, journey. And as I said, wanting to work uh, alongside teams of really great people, really smart, passionate, and nice people. Uh, that's what initially uh, got me interested in startups. And it's just been uh, an absolute pleasure uh, to work with the Dino folks. Um, we, we call ourselves aviators um, because of the AV focus. Um, uh, so, so thank you to all the Dino aviators uh, for making this such an amazing uh, company to work at. Thank you, Eric, and to all the aviators on your team for an absolutely fantastic episode. We are very grateful for your time and hope to have you back soon. Thank you again. Thank you.